gentlemen, you are both drunk on cosmic wine. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Mark Sylvester. And I'm Dr. Richard Schulman. This, this is, is All Psych. Psych. All right. And so it's so. All right. Welcome. It's been a while. No, not on the internet. It seems like just yesterday. It was just yesterday. You know, we're talking about the placebo effect. And when we first talked about this as a topic, I thought, hey, you know what? That's interesting, kind of boring. And when you start scratching at it, like we're going to really scratch at today, there's a whole lot of hidden meaning in there. But, you know, before I get ahead of myself, why don't you uh, say hello to the interwebs? Because they're waiting and kick us off the Zen moment of wealth. I would like to give you a mental wealth tip. Don't try any accents when you're not good at it. Okay, here's some ideas. <laughs> no, there's a better one. Oh, okay. Here's uh, here's some thoughts about when you need to, to forgive yourself. Self forgive. Do you spend a lot of time uh, ruminating about regrets in your life? If you still feel uh, like the pain of past relationships are alive inside of you in the present, um, if you hold long-term grudges, because it's often unconsciously about yourself, if you do a lot of self-punishment when you're not perfect or self-betrayal, you know, you're yeah, you need another finger, I guess. Perfect. I, I heard if I'm not perfect, so I'm putting that one back down. <laughs> And I'm going to put these two down too. No, okay. no. Okay, no, we'll go back. Okay, well, that's fine. So, you know, that we... Uh, and then Roman yeah. numeral five, there's not a five? The self-betrayal is the fifth one. Oh, self-betrayal, okay. It's a little different than self-punishment. You know, we... we um, I think some of that comes under the heading of unhealthy ego. You know, we forget that we can do things we don't think we can do. We stop ourselves from, you know, having good things in life. So anyway, that's the mental wealth tip for today. And I sure felt wealthier even looking it up. I like it. I'm wondering if people are harder on themselves in the last two years as compared to before or the same or easier. It's a good question. I, I, um, I, I don't know. I think people, uh, I would bet harder. And, and the reason is because people are more uh, anxious and um, depressed and angry. Although maybe they're harder on other people. That's a possibility. You know, the, uh, when you lose control in your life, you know, what you're, what you're willing or what you, what you choose to care about may be blaming somebody else, you know? Um, that's what I see more of it, of, of what's going on. And, you know, in some ways that's kind of a human placebo effect to some degree that we're not recognizing that fear, restlessness in ourself. So we project it onto other people. Well, we, we're that, certainly not, um, we're not all in this together, I guess, you know, it's sort of, it's become a, a a place of great division rather than a place of oneness. And, you know, we could write about that. And that certainly does not dovetail into the placebo effect because the very definition of placebo, the Latin, you know, sorry to cut off uh, Marcus Aurelius, you know, and go with the Latin route, but I mean, we did give him Roman numeral number five. So I kind of feel like it's the homage to stoicism, but Placebo literally means I shall be pleasing. Kind of interesting, right? Because I think everyone hears the word placebo and is like, I know what a placebo is. Uh, on face value, I think people know generally what placebo is, but the why is what we're talking about today. Well, they think placebo means nothing. It's actually, yeah. it's actually not nothing. Yeah, and that's, I think, some of the, that, the first controversy of placebo, right? Because a placebo, by definition, is designed to have no therapeutic value. The problem is, it often does, despite that. 
Yes. So, you know, what, what does a placebo look like in the real world? You know, I suppose it could be the proverbial sugar pills. Uh, if you're doing injections, like we were talking before, saline injections instead of morphine or something, if you're studying pain, for instance, or even sham surgeries, which is kind of an interesting concept. But, um, you know, my big beef, like we were talking before the show, is there seems to be a contradiction in the literature and, our, and, and in the way that we approach placebo. Because on one hand, really since the 1950s, it's been established that placebo is a very real effect. Um, it's demonstrable, it's measurable. A lot of times it's as effective as the treatments that they're studying. But there's been cases where it's actually more effective. And the problem with these studies is um, they include placebos as if they are nothing, like you said, right? I mean, the gold standard, I mean, any medical student will tell you a randomized, you know, double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. Well, when you put placebo as a control, as a nothing in a trial, but then at the same time you admit placebo effect is real and it's something, I just invalidated the gold standard of virtually every study since the 1950s you certainly made my day with that so that's like a major 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 problem that just is so big and no one wants to recognize it or talk about it because placebo you know not spoiler alert or anything but to me i think of that as the actual um link or mechanism to the mind-body connection and the fact uh Absolutely. you know like pseudosciesis we've talked about, the belief you're pregnant can actually cause physiologic changes in your in a female's body. You know, their breasts may enlarge, their tummy may pooch out, they, you know, may even feel kicking. And that's that's the ultimate placebo. Maybe it actually works the other way though, that the mind, the mind body creates the placebo. It I I, I you kind of you kind of said, well, the placebo goes into the mind-body effect, but maybe it's the mind-body effect that gives the placebo its power. Well, I think that the placebo draws attention to the mind-body okay, interface. Okay, yeah, 100%. Oh, and I how, totally you know, thought and belief consciousness affects our, and organs, our body, you know, whether that's stress um, causing a, you know, muscle ache or, or tension causing a headache or fear causing a tummy ache. Yeah. So it'd be not just thoughts and beliefs, but emotional reactivity would change your physical. Well, we know it changes your physiology. It changes your experience of the world, experience of yourself. Yeah, I mean, when I was studying neuroscience in college, <clears throat> it was the first time that I actually really got the concept that your world and everything in it is is a is through the, your lens of perception and i think everyone is fully aware of that now is that we're all looking at the same facts but drawing different conclusions <clears throat> or seeing different things you know or not seeing you know did christopher columbus actually uh, show himself to the to the natives some people say they've, they've never seen a ship, then they wouldn't recognize it on the horizon. So that might be where the power of placebo is coming from, is the construct and the template in which you view your world. And if you view, view your treatment or that pill or that surgery or injection as therapeutic, as healing, then yeah, maybe the mind-body did the healing. Um and the blinding was the actual placebo, the belief. Well, you know, and there, there are things that sort of argue um, that there, there needs to be more than just placebo. For example, if somebody uh, has lost uh, the bottom part of their leg through an amputation, I can't hypnotize them and make the leg grow back, at least not yet. And maybe we'll reach a state, you know, where we become like, salamanders who can grow tails back or something but we're certainly not there right now um, you're working on it though right 
you will give Captain Solo and the Wookiee to me. Um, yeah, something, <laughs> something like that. Um, but you know, I used to run a pain management program and so I had to learn all this stuff about pain. And the thing that impressed me the most about placebo was a meta-analysis they did many, I think it was in the late eighties. They took 30 studies on post-surgical pain. They found the most amazing thing to me, it was incredible. If you give somebody uh, morphine or you give somebody a, a shot of saline and tell them it's morphine, they get 55% of the pain relief that you get from the, the actual morphine. Give somebody an aspir aspirin and then give them a sugar pill and tell them it's aspirin, they get 55% of the pain relief. And this seemed to be across the board, no matter what substance you gave, um, with people who wanted to believe that they were getting you know, this medication, um, they would get 55% of the pain relief, which argued that more than half of the pain relief we're getting is um, mind-body stuff, what, you know, belief, emotion, or whatever. And um, I mean, we do work with mind-body. I do a whole post-surgical, pre-surgical prep emotionally that I learned. And it seems to work really well getting people ready for this uh, great challenge. And I've had really good results with it. So what's placebo? I mean, did I, you know, well, it, you, don't, you don't give the person a pill and you say, hey, this is nothing. Let's see if it, you give them the pill and say, well, maybe, this, maybe you got the real stuff and maybe you didn't. It's like yeah. playing a, a scratch off lottery ticket. Everybody's got that thrill and wondering if they've won, right? And you're waiting to see if the if you get better and you want to get better. You believe you get better, you get better. The placebo has the does it is it nothing because it has a tag on it. The tag is this is not a this prob this is, might not be a sugar pill. Maybe this is the real the real aspirin or this may not be a saline solution we're injecting you with, we're injecting you with morphine. So there's, it's not nothing. They're not saying, you know, we're gonna compare how you do on, how somebody did on morphine with how somebody does on nothing. Which is how a control, which is the definition of a control. So to put placebo as a control is a big problem, but why does the tag work? That's the $50,000 question. That, well, that is the, no, whole, the, the whole question, I think. Yeah, the tag is is what's interesting. And obviously it works better for some things than others, like re-sprouting a leg, it might be more difficult. Um, pain was one of the most specific uh, to respond to placebo. I think so was nausea and sleep. And all three of those, I mean, there's a certain amount of perception, certainly the perception of pain. You know, you can have the same stub toe and if you do it in the middle of the night you know by yourself in the dark it, it's going to hurt a lot more than if you stub it while you're running from a bear for your life you don't even notice you might have had the thing ripped off and you don't notice till you get to a safe place so obviously perception's a part of it but i don't believe placebo is that shallow it goes much deeper it's not only a perception it's a belief and out of that belief comes a different experience. So like all of us are having the experience and we used to the consensus agree on reality, not so much anymore, but you know, you can, you can objectively measure sleep better than you can pain. You know, pain is pain, a lot more subjective. Is, yeah. Yeah, it is. But you know, if you, if you, use a placebo to treat insomnia um most people will conclude that you know it uh they slept better um they felt more rested yada yada but if you go look at their sleep study and the objective measurements on the eeg and you look at onset and latency and all the different stages and all that jazz there's there's literally no change so sometimes you don't see the change, but you believe it. Other times you see the change, like pseudosciesis, and you believe it. I wonder if you can see the change and not believe it on a placebo. I think I just twisted my own brain off there. 
Well, in the end, you know, it's going to be a person's experience of life that's going to determine, um, I guess, how if placebo worked or not. If it, if it, I shouldn't say like that. If it had an impact, if I take um, some water and I put, let's say, I put a little dye in it, you know, food dye. And I say, um, oh, actually, this happened when I was in high school. This kid dyed oregano purple, and he sold it as uh, he sold it as some some kind of uh, Lebanese purple, you know, for, as a, a weed. Purple you know? haze. No, he called it Lebanese. I remember this kid. He was a genius, you know. He called it Lebanese purple, and he sold it. And kids, yeah, I want more of that Lebanese purple. They were smoking oregano. <laughs> Okay, um, it's funny. I've forgotten that all these years. It just kind of now he's now he's rich. Of the Lebanese purple, you know. Oh, this kid was amazing. Now he's he, uh, now he's the president of Pfizer. He probably is. You know, he he. This kid at a time where everybody was growing their hair and acting real radical, he wore a white shirt, black pants, and and sort of nerdy shoes and a crew cut, and in his briefcase was enough drugs to to to, uh, to 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 satisfy a hospital you know this you know and i i can't think of his name leonard carlson you know no he would never use drugs. no he wouldn't use me to sell the crap out of him but i remember that because he told me what he was doing he said oh I'm, these kids are idiots i'm gonna die i'm gonna do this i said okay Oh, I don't want to smoke oregano, so. Um, well, he understood of, placebo, clearly. He understood sales, too. And maybe <laughs> maybe that was part of it. Um, he really did understand the mind-body connection. Although, I must say, I never smoked oregano, so maybe it does something. I don't, I don't think so, though. I'm trying to remember. I'm good just... in Italian food, I think, but, you know. It is. It's good on spaghetti. It's good on a lot of things, but I don't think it's the same as marijuana. So. Chicken parmesan. I like it. I like it. I like where you're going with this. There, you know, there are some other factors on placebo that you know I probably should mention, but because there are there are known um, factors that affect placebo. One of which is something called regression to the mean, which is just kind of a statistical. Uh, principle, but I think it's it's better to explain it as kind of, you know, during the course of the experiment, there is the potential for a natural recovery um, or a change in the symptoms just based on the time frame that you're observing them. Mm -hmm. So there are certain other uh, statistical biases built within um, how they how they interpret and placebo, but like I said, to me, those are blown out of the water by the fact that if you're using a placebo as a control and knowing a placebo is going to have an effect, your experiment's garbage by definition and everything after the title should probably be <laughs> rewritten. Would you, would you actually go so far as to say that uh, all advertisements are placebo if they get you to buy a product? Well, is psychotherapy placebo? Well, I, I've been accused of that. The, uh, well, the idea, though, is, is very, you know, the, the idea in our world, which, you know, I don't live in very often, is that we give you a substance and, and, and the placebo is something that is, that is non-substance, perhaps, does not have active ingredients, so I don't know if we if we have decided that um, looking at your thoughts and beliefs or looking at your emotional patterns is nothing, then it's a placebo. But it's not like I'm giving somebody Prozac. I'm just talking to them. And then there's the other part that sometimes just having a human presence is healing. I mean, there's a laying on of hands. Is that placebo? Being included in a study it, it, it is a bias itself because you're under observed behavior and we all behave differently when we're being observed. 
there's a there's a Canadian guy, uh, Jeremy Howick, um, who's an epidemiologist, and but he's kind of more of a philosopher of science, mm-hmm. and you know he he argued that the so because of the errors in in the design of placebo controlled trials and the meta analysis reviewing studies of studies and trying to crunch all that number um he did this and basically decided it concluded that there was no difference between the treatment itself and the placebo effects and that 55 percent number you were talking about for before is really interesting because i think the you know arguably most psychiatrists anyway would would say out of all the treatments from 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 medications to psychotherapy to brain stimulation to everything else under the sun sun um you never get above 55 percent of efficacy so maybe maybe jeremy howick's right (laughs) that there isn't a difference between treatment and placebo effects and that would totally change the way we practice medicine certainly psychiatry well, I think, uh, and it all depends how far down the rabbit hole we're going to go. You know, back during my ill-spent youth, I studied uh, parapsychology for a while. And there was uh, a theory that if you didn't know the outcome of a sporting event or, or any event, if you were to prey on it, even after it happened, it would affect the outcome doesn't seem possible unless you believe that your mind has power to affect events, not just perception of events, but events themselves. Um, Mm. They actually had studies of this and there's one major, major incredible thing that happened on, believe it or not, September 11, 2001, that would show the power of mind Princeton University has these uh, random events generators that scientists use to create control groups. And it just spits out random numbers and they use them to assign them to different groups. Well, guess what happened about 45 minutes before the buildings were hit? It went non-random. And it stayed there for about 24 hours without anybody touching the computers. And the, the theory was that the whole world was focused in a certain way and all that mental energy affected the computer. I don't know for sure, I can tell you, it's a pretty freaky thing to happen just from when nobody changed those, those programs, nobody touched the algorithms. The computer goes non-random for 24 hours at a moment when the, not only bef- when the buildings were hit, but about 45 minutes before. I find that really fascinating. I find that really fascinating and almost ineffable because I've tried to explain that effect. And I think, it, you know, my mind I've, I've discovered doesn't work the, the way normal humans do. And, and I, a lot of times I just think mathematically. And one of my explanations of that is, is really a mathematical explanation. I mean, I, I, uh, I suppose if you bring in the concepts of parallel universes and or the nonlinearity of time, like in uh, uh, the movie with Matthew McConaughey, the uh, oh, inner yeah, stellar, yeah. you know, at the end when, when he's basically standing outside of time and witnessing all of time occurring simultaneously. If we think of that concept, and then you overlay there being an acute psychological trauma to the collective unconscious. It makes sense that it wouldn't have to be felt necessarily in real time. On the other hand, it could be felt in all time, or for some reason, precognition seems to gel in that a lot of times people have a sense of what's going to happen right before it happens. Not so much Edgar Casey, hey, predictions for 2000 years from now. That might be a little different because it's a prognostication rather than a reaction to our, our 3D environment. So I, I think of it 
mathematically kind of as like a Gaussian curve, temporally speaking. So in time, so an event like a first plane hitting hitting the built the tower, um, people the the random number generator that provides to me somewhat of an explanation of how it could be affected by something that's shortly about to happen, but. What I don't remember, because we've talked about that before, is how they determined it was non-random. If the thing yeah, started that, marching yeah. out prime numbers or something, yeah, that, that would I be a heck of a you, lot more eerie. But whoever wrote the article was pretty convinced that that it was accurate. I remember, I, I haven't read the article in a while, I just know that it really, uh, really impressed me. And I, and I think that so many odd things have happened in my life, you know, uh, that were, that involved I don't know what to call it. Mind body, I guess. Mind body spirit, perhaps. And and the and if we go all the way back around, all the way back around, we get somebody who you tell them this is morphine, <laughs> and they get fifty five percent of the pain relief. Tells you at the very least, and this is why we did so many shows called Non Ordinary Mind, that the how powerful the mind is if you have the user's manual for it, you know, and that there's so much more to our science than there's no much more to heaven and earth than been explained by our science Horatio, as I think Hamlet once said. It is so true. And that's I think it was why we go down this, what'd say? I think it was Shakespeare that made Hamlet say oh, that's that. True. To Horatio. But, what? See, but I like Hamlet. He was so, he was so depressed. They didn't, they, you know, he didn't have the placebo back then. Um, the, the, the bottom line is any good doctor will tell you that if you can get a person's expectations in a certain way, it really helps. Now, can you tell them, okay, if you click this pen three times, and say there's no place like home, it'll cure your cancer. Well, maybe not. I think it, I wonder... I think it would. I think uh, uh, to some degree, maybe, maybe even if it's not measurable, I think it would. Because, you know, there's some crazy concepts in quantum physics that, you know, that the, the possibility that the random accumulation of interstellar dust might build a, a tesla there's a probability there's a certainty that it would occur too and it can be calculated um you could argue like well that's what we did you know we came from interstellar dust we got a planet we got evolved some species we got an elon musk and uh you know i have a nice uh, tesla now so well, I would hope that you get one. The, I'm trying. Well, if you, but how about this? I, I, when I had my knee surgery afterwards, my surgeon said, as I was, as they were wheeling you out, you were still out. I was whispering in your ear, you're going to get all better, Rich. Now he happens to be, he happened to be a very nice guy and my knee did get tremendously better. Um, so he believed, and you know, surgeons are not noted for, you know, woo woo. Um, he truly believed that if he could give me that message to my unconscious, that it would help. Certainly doesn't can have we, side effects. Can we prove it? Not really, but my knee got a lot better. I, we can't disprove that, that his uh, positive attitude changed things for me. I know my old mentor, uh, Arnold, who was the oldest 58 year old guy in history when he died, he had shrapnel in him from the war. It's, his pancreas was shot off. He was an instant diabetic. I'm taking him in for surgery, drove him up to Bay Pines and, and, I, and I, you know, trying to be a you know, caring, empathic person. How you doing, man? He goes, excellent. I said, your, uh, your arm is hanging by like a tiny thread. Uh, where does that excellent? He goes, oh, I, uh, I program my mind for excellence. Your brain believes everything you say. So uh, I suggest you try it. It worked. And then well, there've been a lot, lot done on positive thinking. When we go down placebo, we're going down all these roads. 
well, children have a much more robust uh, placebo response than adults. And I mean, you, there, you could certainly say, well, yeah, it's because they're, you know, they don't know nothing or they're, they're more influential to the power of suggestion. I just think they're closer to spirit and what they believe is more likely to manifest. And, and kind of what I was saying about the Gaussian curve, we're all at the very tip of that, of that curve, experiencing the now and some version of consensus reality, let's just say. But yet at the same time, you stop and ask anybody, hey, have you ever had that thing where you're thinking about somebody and then a couple seconds later they call? Everyone will tell you yes. Now, is that coincidental? Maybe. Ask people if they think it's coincidental, they'll say no, but they got no idea how to explain it. So if I think of somebody and then through the collective unconscious or some sort of a temporal blur at the peak of this Gaussian curve, then I am either sending an unconscious message to them that makes them then receive that, think of me and then say, oh, geez, I got to call him. Then they call or I'm slightly to the left of the Gaussian curve and I'm just perceiving something slightly before uh, all of the random events of, of existence have, have narrowed the possible outcomes and constrained it to this moment that appears this way. Whereas someone like Edgar Casey, Casey's way out, uh, you know, in the really skinny part of that Gaussian curve because he's able to, let's say, predict so far in the future. Um, I think there's a temporal influence on placebo effect too, a short trial versus a long trial. You know, if you if you do the pen three times and say, watch your leg grow back, the chance that that will happen, you know, as far as quantum physics is concerned, that there is a certainty that that will happen. But the percentage and the possibility is probably closer to the, you know, Tesla from from Stardust kind of thing. But at the same time, maybe if you did a five year study and you click the thing three times every day, kind of like the button they hit and lost, maybe uh, maybe they would start sprouting a leg. More likely to anyway. Okay, and and you got to include emotion in that. So let's say let's get closer to rather than clicking a pen three times uh i wonder if a physician tells you that the there's morphine in this syringe versus a nurse versus a tech versus some guy off the street if that changes that 55 percent or are you working with highly hypnotizable subjects or people who really want that pain relief uh yes I, I believe so actually there's studies that have shown that um i'm trying to think of the, the the most similar one that i can think of was basically showing that capsules show a more robust placebo response than tablets which was interesting and then injections show more of a robust placebo response than capsules I thought that was really interesting. I didn't know totally what to make of that. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? It's kind of similar to what you're saying. It's kind of, you know, once again, we're back to perception, belief, you know, uh, authority. And, and I think mm -hmm. it may be one of the reasons that people have such trouble questioning authority. They want this to work. They really want this to work, you know? Um, you want to believe that your leaders, your parents, that uh, your teachers, your football coaches, that they have your best interests at heart. And, and maybe part of it is that wish because placebo is not, oh, by the way, here's one pill. They don't say we're gonna test morphine against a pill that has nothing your perception is you might be getting the real shot. Yeah, otherwise it would be called a nocebo, which we've touched on before on this channel. But uh, placebo is sort, of sort of the anti, or nocebo is the anti-placebo effect. And I think it would be better of a use of a control, but a control should just be the absence of treatment. It's just how do you blind the absence of treatment? That's why we fell into the whole placebo control model. Well, you know, and, and once again, we could 
you know, sort of split hairs on the semantics, but science is about observation. And um, the idea that we observe what happens when we take something that we say might be morphine, or we tell them it is morphine, and how do they respond? To me, that's, that's what science is all about. You do something and you observe it and write it down and see if you can organize what you see, that it makes sense and, it, and it's worth uh, moving forward with. And, and there's no doubt, you know, placebo. Uh, I'll give you a, a great example as we wind the show down. My son, when he was um, three, he told me there were sharks under the bed. You know, kids come up with stuff like that. So I got out a uh, can of Lysol and I said, this is shark spray, where are they? And I sprayed, you know, so where, anywhere else? And then he went to bed and he was happy. Maybe there were sharks under the bed, I didn't see any, but. It could be interdimensional sharks. Well, but you know, we make, you and I make jokes about that, but I'm not so sure that's not, I guess you weren't joking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was thinking remember. dimension or sharks from a different time and place, or you know, maybe that maybe they were the sharks that swam there. Uh, you know, maybe they were the spirit ago. of dead sharks, you know, from some oil spill in the Gulf or something. Yeah. The bottom line is that he felt better and he went to sleep easily that night because someone had sprayed those sharks. Let's assume just for a, a minute that there were inter interdimensional sharks there. They wouldn't go away because I sprayed with Lysol. In his head, they went away. And, and maybe that was that was the ticket. We talked about that on our Ghosts and Goblins show, our, our, our Phantasms, because those who are more likely to see ghosts are people that are either near death themselves, which is, brings up the temporal thing. They believe in them which brings up a psychological thing. Um, and then those people that don't want to see ghosts, don't believe in ghosts, essentially they're like those Native Americans looking on the horizon. You know, they're, they're gonna, they could have it, they could see a ghost and they'll be able to explain it away as something else. So that, that belief is, um, I think, probably where the placebo effect truly begins, um, which sounds like a really simple statement, but it's actually quite complicated if you think about it, because it's our ability to believe in something that will affect its outcome. And science has recognized that really since about the 50s as well. So that's what the purpose of the show is, right? Open your mind. Get people to open their mind, analyze. You know, it's really nasty if you pay attention to your thoughts for the first time in a while. It's really nasty what the things that you think say about yourself and uh, your family, your friends, your job. Um, that's kind of like what I what I liked. What you said is I, I program for positivity. It re you know, the funny thing is, and I'll, I'll wrap up on this, this thought, because I think it's a real powerful one. Well, that positive thinking stuff, it really works. And people say, well, how do I do that? So, well, you, when you fight it, <laughs> you know, and that, so is that fight placebo? Well, you know, I'm not giving you a pill. I'm not changing your nutrition. All I'm saying is when you get that negative thought, Say that's a lie, let's get to the truth. You know, how are you doing? Excellent. How are you doing, Mark? Excellent. Woohoo! Arnold's happy from the other side. He just patted me on the back. Yeah, you got through, Rich. And uh, as we wrap up the show, we hope everyone feels better from just listening to this conversation. Yeah, and if you would like, uh further research and, and uh, to pay homage to the late great Marcus Aurelius, look up stoicism. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, I still, you know, for a guy that lived what, 1500 some years ago, uh, it's still really applicable. A lot of his uh, ideas and principles and they really are about programming your mind for positivity and, and perception. 
Um, and what are the consequences if you're right versus wrong? He, he was a really fascinating character. You're kind of fascinating yourself when you talk like that. Yeah, well, I, I, it's a coincidence that I've named Marcus Aurelius. It says so right here on the screen somewhere. Yeah, were, you, were you named after Marcus Silvestris? No, but I got called Marcus Aurelius as a child by my stepfather and then wow. Marcus Welby. And now, uh, you know, they just go with, hey, you. On that note. Until next time, are you going to? Be, be well? well. Be well? Question mark? Yes. No. You will. Be, be well. You will be well. Say it authoritatively. It works better. I believe in you. All right, join us next time. You will give the Wookiee and Captain Solo to me. Konnichiwa. <laughs>